Utah is home to several famous dinosaur graveyards, but the Falcaria site is different. It contains, almost exclusively, the bones of a single species. Falcarius is preserved in a site with at least dozens and probably hundreds of dead dinosaurs. So the obvious question is, why are they there? What killed them? How are they deposited there? Well, sites like this are actually quite common among dinosaurs. We actually have dinosaur bone beds, as we call them, from various countries around the world. Possible explanations might include drought, they might include volcanism, flood, some type of poisoning like botulism. So there's a whole range of hypotheses. So the way the science works from here is we go just like the forensic detectives of today. We collect all of our clues and we rule out hypotheses and we see what's left over. Other single animal bone beds, known as monospecific sites, have been explained as herds drowned in flash floods. But this Falcarius site is not an ancient riverbed. Another possibility for theropod mass mortalities or perhaps disease, things like botulism, uh, bad water, poison water. You know, you have a, a red tide. Algae blooms, releases toxins. Animals come to drink. They die. Animals smell those carcasses, come to feed on them, and they die. So we have a number of theropod accumulations that are associated with shallow bodies of water. And these things tend to go fetid. But the density of bones uh, suggests something unusual was going on. Uh, normally in nature, you may find a dead animal here or there. But to have this density of animals of one species is very unusual and suggests that we should be looking for an unusual cause. The Suarez sisters are looking for that cause. They eagerly take to their roles as dinosaur detectives. Paleo CSI, maybe, yeah, I, paleo guess, CSI. I guess, could so. be potentially, could be potentially, I mean, you know, you don't ever want to just rely on geochemistry, that's, that's one of the big things in geology, is you never just rely on geochemistry, you always multiple look at the lines rocks, of evidence. you have to look at multiple lines of evidence, so and you that's, have to, you that's know. what we're doing here with Jim, Jim and Lindsay are studying the animal, um, Selena's studying the geochemistry, and I'm studying the uh, stratigraphy and sedimentology and the paleosols and the taphonomy and the taphonomy the actual bones themselves and all of those will be part of a puzzle that we put together back in the lab Selena Suarez turns to rare earth geochemistry to help solve this mystifying puzzle the good thing about this analysis is that it's not very destructive to the bones we only need a little bit by looking at the concentration of rare earth elements within the fossil the chemistry of its environment can be determined. Each fossil contains the unique signature of the groundwater it was fossilized in. The way we do that is by taking a piece of bone, just a little sliver from the top layer of the bone, because that's where most of the elements get concentrated. And these elements get into the bone when they're fossilized. So as the bone turns from an organic piece of matter into an actual, you know, rock, an actual inorganic piece of matter, these elements get incorporated into the bone. The magic of rare earth geochemistry lies in determining the relative concentrations of these uncommon elements in each fossil. The dissolved bone is next run through a high-tech spectrometer, which actually counts the atoms of each rare earth element present. It does this by bombarding the bone solution with a 6,000 degree argon flame. What the machine does then is it measures the mass of each of those different elements that are charged now. So once it goes from that and it counts all the uh, atom atoms, um, it gets shown on to the computer. By analyzing these numbers, the relative concentrations of elements gives each fossil its unique signature. What we're seeing is that the animals were probably being fossilized at different times and dying off in great numbers at different times because you not only see differences in the rocks, the type of rocks, but also differences in the geochemistry and the conditions of the bones. Obviously, we have a huge deposit of this animal, Falcarius, in a very strange environment where you have lots of springs popping up. And it's very unusual that you see all these animals dying in some type of relationship to these springs. The Falcaria site revealed at least two die-offs. I'm standing here 
on the contact between the Morrison Formation, the Red Rocks behind me, and the base of the Cedar Mountain Formation. The main quarry has boned right from this contact up through to about this interval. Overlying this, right here is the cap rock of carbonate. We have this great mass mortality. Hundreds of animals died in this environment right here. About a kilometer away, half a mile if you will, the Suarez sisters doing their research on these carbonate rocks found a second mass mortality of Falcarius, our new dinosaur. This proves that there was at least two mass mortalities of these animals in this immediate area. Jim thinks this, this stuff is Falcarius. We'll, we'll see once uh, more of this material is analyzed. Could the same springs that preserve these bones be the killer of these animals? That is, for now, an unanswerable question. But these hard deposits may well prove to be why these fossils exist at all. And what we're working on is a theory that perhaps this cap rock that occurs through this area held down a skiff of sediment on this erosion surface that preserved these animals where everywhere else this age of rocks was removed. This could well be the oldest Cretaceous site in all of North America. As with any new discovery, Falcarius raises as many questions as it does answers. Behind us, we have the red rocks of the Morrison formations, red mudstones of Jurassic age. They're overlain by the more drab sediments of the yellow cat member of the Cedar Mountain Formation. Both of these rock units have faunal ties with Europe and actually even with Africa. However, the discovery of Falcarius shows us an animal that was only known in China, particularly from beds this old. How did it get here? Well, at this time, Alaska didn't exist. It was an island floating in the North Pacific, floating northward for a collision with a piece of Canada, and this wasn't to happen for another 15 million years or so. The only route to China from Utah was through Europe. This is where the close relatives of these animals lived. Did they originate here, or did they originate in China? That question is totally open at this point.